Hello, my name is Jet Smith and I'm the head coach at Highland High School in Pocatello, Idaho. This is a video for a topic lecture on the upcoming season's policy debate topic for the year, all about fiscal redistribution. Now, unlike a lot of the other great topic lectures that are out there, I'm not really going to be giving you the background on the topic or where it came from or the history of economics and fiscal redistribution in the United States. Instead, I'm going to focus specifically on what it's going to be like debating the topic first talking to you about the topic direction, about what it might look like, then discussing topicality so that we understand the parameters for what's gonna happen. We'll go over the biggest affirmative areas and then some core neg ground at the end. So first up, the topic reads, the United States federal government should substantially increase fiscal redistribution in the United States by adopting a federal jobs guarantee, expanding social security and or providing a basic income. Now, I'm really excited for this resolution. I think that this is the best policy debate topic that I've seen in years, and I certainly believe that it's going to be better than last year's because, let's be honest, the writing, the ground division, the lack of unity between all the different plans, the lack of solid neg ground that wasn't critiques made it a bit of a rough one. I think that this one improves on the last one in a lot of ways. So first, let's talk about the topic direction, uh, about fiscal redistribution in particular. Now, there is a debate in debate spaces more than there is in the actual literature about what is meant by fiscal redistribution. Pretty much every definition out there says that fiscal redistribution means taxes and transfers. The problem is that word and in between taxes and transfers. Does that and imply both or does it imply either? So you are either taxes and transfers or taxes and or transfers when you look at how this topic could go. So the first version of the topic that says that fiscal redistribution requires both a tax and a transfer, uh, the word and is a joint phrase. So here is from the topic proposal paper. Uh, the phrase fiscal redistribution is well defined. It requires a tax of the upper economic half of society and transfer of economic resources. This dual requirement that fiscal redistribution must tax the rich and fund the poor, this is the most limiting interpretation, but one that still includes core affirmative cases. So this version of the topic is probably pretty good for negative generics and not as good for affirmative ground and creativity. Whereas the other version of the topic, where you say that the word and is distributive, which means that it requires taxes and or it requires transfers, uh, would be saying something like fiscal redistribution is two modes of taxes and social transfers, two components part achieved by direct taxes and part achieved by social transfers. Now, this is much better for affirmative ground than it is for negative generics. And this is the version that is used by camps like the UMIC debate camp, the DDI debate camp, and kind of the GDI debate camp, along with second affirmatives and kids on Reddit, whereas the other version is the one that seems to be being used by the topic paper authors, by the NSDA and the NFHS and the Baylor briefs, and then some camps that have been using this definition in their lectures would be ND, uh, MSU, and kind of GDI. So... The community is divided on this, and I think it all depends on which side that you're going to be on in every debate as far as what side of the topic or what version of the topic you'd rather debate. So if you look at fiscal redistribution as requiring both taxes and transfers, then the affirmatives have to do two things in every single plan. The first is raise revenue by taxing the rich, and there are a lot of different ways to do so, which we'll talk about later. And then second, they have to spend that money that they get from taxing the rich by transferring it to the poor or the middle class through a job guarantee, basic income, or social security expansion program. Whereas the second version of the topic says that uh, the affirmatives probably have to spend by transferring to the poor through a job guarantee, basic income, and or social security programs and or they can pay for that transfer through a whole bunch of stuff. Taxes would be one thing, but they could also fund that redistribution through deficit spending or going into debt, cutting other wasteful spending programs, selling assets owned by the federal government, and even by cutting other programs. Uh, so whether they be welfare programs or just any government program. And every single one of the above, obviously, taxes, deficit spending, all of those could happen in a multiple different forms. Just like how on the other side, just because it has to be taxing the rich doesn't mean that every single tax on the rich is going to look the exact same.
So which direction is better and which is this lecture going to use? Better is going to depend on what side you're on. However, my personal preference and the way that I'll be focusing this lecture is on the more limited version of the topic with and implying both or joint. That's not to say I'm not going to discuss any affirmative cases that don't work under the other interpretation, but that I am mostly focused on policies that both tax the rich and transfer the funds from that tax to the poor. So a lot of people have been talking about how the evidence that says that it's supposed to be both is terrible. And most of the time the cards are from the 80s and they say that it's only in like the specific card that it refers to actually meaning both. However, I think that this card is really recent and it does a pretty great job at explaining that it makes sense for fiscal redistribution to be both. The idea is that you, in order to redistribute and not just distribute, you have to collect something and then give it out. If you're not collecting, you're not redistributing. So redistribution comes after taxes, net of transfers, and you have to be able to look at both of those two things. So. Um, with that being said, you also need to be ready to defend your vision of the topic. Usually the negative is going to be trying to defend the first and the affirmative is going to be trying to defend the second. So if the negative is defending the first, which is saying that fiscal redistribution is two steps, taxing and transferring, then you can use arguments on topicality like framers intent. This is what the topic authors wanted, that it guarantees the negative positions that they can read because they know exactly what the affirmative is going to do for funding, or at least what type of funding they're going to do. And that it means that they have access to solid generics, which is good because it makes policy debate more accessible and easier to prepare. Whereas the affirmative will say that fiscal redistribution is a process that has two different methods that can or cannot be put together and that is taxing and transferring. So their justifications will probably say that their definitions are higher quality, that the affirmatives will get to be more creative, um, and that they won't only have to exist to answer tax is bad, and that topic generics are not good because they mean that negatives get lazy and are less likely to actually engage the affirmative. So now that we've discussed that term in the topic, there's still more issues with topicality to cover that really constrain the size of this topic. Even at its most largest, I think that this is one of the smaller policy debate topics that we've seen in a while, uh, but there are some interpretations that could make it smaller still. So fiscal redistribution, we have the must tra tax and transfer interp, and we also have the argument that it has to be progressive, that the tax has to be on the rich and that the transfer has to be to the not rich, the poor and the middle class. The federal jobs guarantee, there's a couple of different interpretations floating around in camp files and in the literature. So there are lots of people who say that it must be universal, aka any American anywhere in the country who wants a job has to be able to get one according to your program if it's going to be a federal jobs guarantee, that it has to give a living wage and benefits to its employees, that the jobs have to come from the government, not just the government forcing a business to hire you. And there is an interp that is very important, although that I don't know how good the evidence is that says that the affirmative plan cannot specify what type of job, that the program has to leave it up to local cities and states to determine what the jobs look like in order to qualify as a federal jobs guarantee. Then we have expanding social security, and you'll notice that social security is capitalized, whereas the other two areas are not. And that's because a really important term or a really important interp on this topic is that when you talk about social security and the S's in those words are capitalized, you're referring to a very specific program in the United States that gives insurance or benefits to people who are retired or living in old age, survivors of people who are uh, re who retired and were part of the program but have passed away, and people who are on disability. So only those groups are implied by this interpretation. There's another one that says that you have to fall under the Social Security Act, which is much larger than the first interpretation, but still puts a constraint on Social Security uh, as a set of programs rather than just anything that tries to provide a social safety net. And then lastly, we have uh, that there's a difference between extending Social Security and expanding Social Security, where extending is giving it money because you may have heard that Social Security could run out of money in a few years, whereas expanding is increasing the number of people applying to the program or the number of uh, the amount of benefits or the size of benefits that people can get from it. 
The third main topic area, basic income, there's a couple of different interpretations here too. Uh, and that is first, it must be universal. Now the topic does not use the word universal. However, most definitions for what a basic income is say that it's basically universal. So that word might as well be in parentheses. But if you have to defend a universal basic income, then the only thing that the affirmative could change on this part of the topic is how much money it is, which is pretty limiting and would basically mean this AF area is more like just one plan that could be read. Other interpretations include that you have to pay everyone who qualifies to the program equal amounts of money. There's a really crazy one that says that it must be enough money to live on, which is mostly used in other countries, but someone could argue that it's not a basic income if it's not enough to live. So there's interps that say that it can't be means tested, which means that you can't qualify for the program only if you make a certain amount of money or not make a certain amount of money or you go to work. And then the final requirement would be that you cannot have a work requirement. A basic income is not a work fair program where the only way to access it is to prove that you have a job. Least importantly is increase. You could use the same tried and true interp that says increase means pre-existing rather than uh, creation. So you'd be saying that in order to qualify as increasing fiscal redistribution and not creating fiscal redistribution, you have to take an existing tax on the rich and increase that tax on the rich. Um, so those are all kind of the topicality interpretations I've seen that aren't completely nonsensical. So now that we've discussed the parameters of the topic, we're going to go over 20 of the biggish or biggest AFs on the topic that I've seen from a variety of different sources, whether they be briefs, whether they be open evidence, whether they be being discussed in Facebook groups and on Reddit groups and in discords, as well as what I've seen in the literature. So we're going to talk about five different areas. We're going to talk about taxes, specifically existing taxes on the rich, as well as new taxes on the rich that could be adopted, uh, but only very briefly. So it'll be your job to research those more specifically to figure out your AFS funding mechanism. And then we'll talk about transfers, which are the three main policies that occur under this topic. And that is adopting a federal jobs guarantee, expanding social security, and providing a basic income. So first, let's talk about taxation mechanisms. So this is how the affirmative is going to increase taxes on the rich to decrease the gap between how much income and wealth the rich has versus how much the poor and middle class have. And middle class is in parentheses because if you've read a lot of uh, anti-capitalist literature, you'll recognize that there's no such thing as the middle class. So... The first category under this is expanding existing taxes on the upper class to raise more money from them. There's a whole bunch of different types of taxes that currently exist that are progressive in some ways, but might not be raising enough money uh, to pay for current programs or to do enough to reduce economic inequality. So this is uh, includes the capital gains tax, which is uh, a tax on the amount of money that you make when you sell an asset like a stock or a bond. There's the marginal income tax rate, which is the idea that for there are multiple different thresholds. So for example, every dollar you make over a million is taxed at 57%, although that's not a real rate. So you could say we should increase the amounts of those, the percentages of those. The estate tax or the tax uh, for when someone passes away uh, on their estate. Payroll taxes, which is a tax that's paid both by the employer uh, and by the employee, and they pay roughly equal amounts, but there's a cap on how much money uh, you have to pay that tax on. Uh, stock transfer taxes, where you give your stock to someone else, as well as the corporate tax rate, which is incredibly low and the lowest it's been in a long time, even before Donald Trump decreased it. And then lastly is each of these taxes has ways that rich people avoid paying them through different parts of the law. So you could also just close loopholes in the current taxes that already exist to get people in the upper class to pay their fair share. The second part of taxes would be imposing new taxes on the upper class. So rather than expanding existing taxes, you could create new ones. And there are so many different kinds. Uh, to briefly explain them here, an inheritance tax would say that not only is wealth taxed when a person dies, but when it passes to a new person that they also have to pay on those. 
uh, a wealth tax. Wealth is different than income. Income is the amount of money that you are making every single month or every single certain period, whereas wealth would be assets that you have. So a house that you own would be an asset. A car that you own would be an asset. Uh, and most of the time, the richest of the rich have their money in their wealth, not just in their income, but that wealth is not really taxed. If we instated an accrued capital gains tax, this means that if you buy stock in something and it gets more valuable in a year, normally right now, if you don't sell it, then you only have to pay taxes on it when you sell. But an accrued capital gains tax would say, if you own a stock or if you own a bond and it increases in value during a year, then you have to pay a tax on the amount that it gained by the end of the year. Um, a pied a terre tax is a tax on secondary residences, which are not your primary. So this would be like vacation homes. Carried interest tax is just another form of a capital gains tax. Uh, a stock buyback tax would be levied against companies when they buy back their own stocks. Uh, a CEO pay gap tax would say that you have to pay more in taxes for depending on the amount of times of money that your CEO makes. So if the CEO of your company earns 20 times the amount that your average employee does, then you'd pay a lower rate than a business where the CEO makes 5,000 times what the average employee makes. You could do a bank levy or a tax, which would be taxing uh, gains made by banks more, which may uh, cause them to behave better as well. You could also do luxury item taxes like yachts or or private jets, and then also digital ad data tax that is frequently used uh, by the rich. So the amount of data that they garner from other people through the selling of their ads uh, or the amount of revenue that they accrue from those digital ads could also be taxed. So all of these are different forms of taxes that don't really currently exist that could be put on the upper class to pay for social programs. So now that we've discussed the tax side, we're going to focus on the transfer side. So the first type of transfer allowed by the resolution is through adopting a federal jobs guarantee. Now, this essentially means that the government will provide jobs to any American who wants one, and those jobs will pay a living wage and have benefits like insurance, although this is going to change depending on the proposal. So the first F under this area that we'll talk about uh, is a novice case area, and that is the Green New Deal. Now, the Green New Deal is a proposal that has a whole bunch of different supporters, a whole bunch of different authors and co-sponsors. Some common figures you might have heard attached to it are Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, as well as Bernie Sanders. Now, the Green New Deal is an expansive proposal with a whole bunch of stuff in it. But one of the biggest, if not the most important parts of the Green New Deal is a federal jobs guarantee program. Now, what are some potential benefits of this federal jobs guarantee program? Number one is reducing unemployment, which is going to be common for pretty much every single federal jobs guarantee plan. That's your goal is to get rid of unemployment. So anybody who wants a job but hasn't been able to get one will be able to get one. Uh, you also will be able to create green jobs or jobs that specifically exist to help the environment. And that means that you will be able to contribute to the solution uh, against climate change through passage of the Green New Deal's job guarantee. It's also more likely that other countries follow along if the United States does a Green New Deal. Now, how can the negative respond to this case area? Well, it depends. If the affirmative is only defending the federal jobs guarantee part of the Green New Deal, then it's probably going to have smaller impacts than if they passed the whole thing. And most of the cards are supporting the potential impacts of the entire project, not just the federal jobs guarantee program. Whereas if the affirmative is defending the entire Green New Deal being passed, then I would argue that is incredibly extra topical, which means that sure, they do the resolution, but they also do more than the resolution because there is plenty of stuff in the Green New Deal that would not count as fiscal redistribution under the topic. It also means that they probably apply to way more disadvantages because there are lots of people who disagree with the entire Green New Deal program so that you'll be able to get an expansive number of case-specific disadvantages. The next F is a federal jobs guarantee specifically to create infrastructure jobs, which is part of the Green New Deal, but this one would be more targeted specifically to infrastructure and not necessarily green infrastructure projects. Again, this has the potential to solve uh, unemployment, but most of our infrastructure, which would be our roads, our bridges, our airports, our uh, railroads, 
our waterways are in immense need of dis of repair. They're in a state of disrepair. We get like the worst ratings in the world for developed countries all the time for our infrastructure. Uh, and improving our infrastructure will likely improve our shipping speeds and the amount of trade that we can do with other countries. We can also expand our public health infrastructure to be more prepared for future pandemics or other disease outbreaks. How can the negative respond to this? Well, they could read a counter plan to create a national infrastructure investment bank instead. Uh, there's also lots of disadvantages about how this would negatively hurt the private sector, which we'll get into later. And you can also read the topicality argument that you're not allowed to specify what kind of jobs would be offered. You can only give examples uh, from essentially an exhaustive list according to this topicality argument. The next F for a federal jobs guarantee would be concerning elder care or caring for the elderly. Many of you probably have grandparents who are living in assisted living facilities or who are living with other members of your family and being taken care of in their retirement. So a federal jobs guarantee program for elder care would help us, yes, fight unemployment, but it would also help us care for the rapidly increasing part of our population that is aging out of the workforce. Uh, and it would also allow family caregivers to probably get a job in caring for their specific family member so that they can have the money to do so. Because many people are forced not to go to work so that they can take care of the elders in their lives. Um, but those people are then economically disadvantaged. Elder abuse is also rampant in a lot of privatized uh, elder or assisted living facilities, which means that perhaps this would help decrease that. How can we respond to this? The negative could read a counter plan that uh, reforms elder care instead of starting a federal jobs guarantee, one that gives tax credits to people who engage in elder care uh, or just invest in more solutions to help the elderly rather than a federal jobs guarantee. Again, there are plenty of disadvantages about how this would hurt the private sector. You'll be able to find evidence that it would destroy the part of our economy that currently makes money off of taking care of elders. And again, you could read the topicality, no specification of job um, argument here. Next is a child care jobs guarantee where really your plan is to institute universal child care, but the way that you're doing that is through a federal jobs guarantee program. Again, this would help fight unemployment, but it would also help fight the affordability crisis for child care in this country. Uh, child care is incredibly expensive for younger and older children, which often means that in order to support a family, both parents in the modern age have to work. But if both parents have to work, then how are they supposed to be able to take care of their children? Well, they have to either give them to a family member or they have to take them to daycare uh, or some other child care thing, especially in the summer. But those are far and few between, and they're often incredibly expensive, where some people have to get second jobs just to afford the child care for their first job. The other reason why this would probably matter is it would allow us to meet labor force uh, issues. Now, most people who disagree with the federal jobs guarantee say that one of the problems is that it will take away jobs from the private sector. But this actually has an opportunity to give more jobs to the private sector because people right now who can't get a job because they have to stay home and take care of their kids would be able to do so if there was a free or universal child care program as created by the federal jobs guarantee. This is also probably better for child development. There are plenty of studies that show that high quality child care uh, is much better for a child than being left at home alone or going to uh, underfunded or lacking uh, proper quality child care. Some alternatives or negative responses to this would be a child care subsidies counter plan, a child tax credit counter plan, uh, or a child care vouchers counter plan, all of which would basically try and help families get child care more easily in the current system rather than adopting a massive change like a federal jobs guarantee to create universal child care. This would also likely cause private sector disadvantages. Daycare and childcare is a huge industry that would pretty much be wiped out if it became a federal program for free. And you can also, again, read the topicality argument that uh, you are not allowed to specify what type of job. Next, we have Education and Teaching Assistance Federal Jobs Guarantee Program. Once again, this will likely help solve unemployment, but chances are, if you're watching this, you're in education in some way, either as a student or as a teacher. Uh, and you'll know that there is a massive teacher shortage right now. Very few people want to become teachers. And that's because of how much you're expected to do with how little money that you get. 
a federal jobs guarantee program that gave every teacher or most teachers or teachers who really needed it a teaching assistant would massively increase the quality of life uh, and job satisfaction of teachers by having someone who can be there if you need to go make copies or if you need to go use the restroom or if you need to work with a student one-on-one -on -one or talk to someone out in the hallway, there's still an adult in the room. Uh, teacher assistants or schools that have teaching assistants also have shown that they have higher test scores and higher graduation rates, and having more trusted adults in a child's life can improve their development uh, and outcomes across the lifetime. What are some downsides to this? Well, uh, well, the negative could say that we should instead just raise teacher pay uh, or raise school support specialist pay or hire more of them as a counter plan. There's also reason to believe that if this is supposed to be a program that any American can get, that we'd be subjecting our children to being around people who maybe they shouldn't be uh, if any random citizen can get a job. And there's also reason to believe that uh, you could read the topicality argument here that they can't, again, specify exactly or only one type of job that would be available under their program. Next, we have a federal jobs guarantee for economically depressed areas. This was almost a novice case area but it did not make the top four. So this would say that we do a federal jobs guarantee program, but we only put it available in cities or states that are experiencing high levels of income inequality or really high levels of poverty concentration. So this would hopefully help fight unemployment in those areas where it's most prevalent. And when you decrease unemployment and when more people have jobs and money to provide for themselves, we see that crime is reduced. This also means that communities will likely become more developed because the jobs could be in community development projects. And it also will help out other businesses there or help to revitalize the area because when you don't have a job, you don't have money to spend at local areas. But when you get jobs, then you you can support or partake in other parts of the local economy. Now, arguments against this that the negative could read might be a business attraction or a tax incentives counter plan that says that instead of doing a federal jobs guarantee, we should just try and incentivize private businesses to try and come to the economically depressed areas and hire people that way. You could read private sector disadvantages here about how it would hurt businesses that people would stop working for them and go work for the federal government instead. And again, you could uh, read a topicality argument instead of no job specification. I apologize, I forgot to change this. It should say topicality must be universal. And you say that if only certain people living in certain places could have these jobs, uh, then it's not really a guarantee. It's just a federal job program. Lastly, in this category of federal jobs guarantee is a national service federal jobs guarantee. You might have heard Pete Buttigieg is a common political figure uh, that has talked about something like this. Again, this would help fight unemployment, but specifically this would say that we want more people to join the military or join national service organizations like the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, Teach for America, things like that. Uh, this might help bring us together nationally by letting people serve their country and see what their country does for them to bring people together. It would give young people who are graduating high school an opportunity to do something that will develop their skills and pay them, uh, which is pretty hard to find. Most of the time, you either have to go to college or you have to accept a low-skilled job to survive. And also, a national service program with lots of people in it would help us be better prepared to respond to natural disasters uh, or to potential military events. What are some things the negative can say in response? Well, they could expand current existing voluntary service programs without making them a full-on job guarantee. You, again, can talk about private sector disadvantages or even college admissions disadvantages on this one. And again, you could say that this is too specific uh, to count as a federal jobs guarantee. So the next area of the topic we'll be discussing is expanding social security, which has the potential to be the biggest part of this topic. If this topic becomes so large that it feels unmanageable, I will theorize now that it will be because of this area. So expanding social security, according to the more limited interpretation, would say that it is increasing the number of people and or the size of payments uh, two people that qualify for old age, survivor, and disability, or OASD assistance. Now that is the capital S, capital S, Social Security. But Social Security more generally or internationally is really any government program that's meant to provide a social safety net to help people economically in case of disaster or in case of poverty. So you can see how those are two very different things. So 
The first app that we'll talk about under this topic area is a novice case area, and that is the Medicare for All affirmative and a stronger or similar version of that that people will also read is the single payer healthcare affirmative. Now, this affirmative is going to have a lot of advantages with it. One, it can help provide financial security. Millions of people in the United States are experiencing financial debt, and millions more don't go to the doctor for something because they're afraid of how much it's going to cost. We've heard about people who call an Uber or who call a friend to take them to the hospital instead of an ambulance because they're afraid of how much it's going to cost. So this will give people financial security and let them get their health care. Additionally, uh, health outcomes are likely to be better if more people go to the doctor, there will be less sickness going around that is untreated. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence that says that the health outcomes of people in countries with programs like Medicare for All are better than ours. In the long run, it will save money. Currently, the things that we spend the most on of anything are Social Security and Medicare for All and other federal health insurance programs. So in the long run, uh, both individually will people save costs because they're not having to pay for their health insurance or crazy bills, but the federal government, according to some estimates, will save money as well. Finally, we have reducing disparities where health outcomes right now uh, don't exactly appear equally when you look at racial lines, when you look at disability lines, gender, economics, all sorts of things. This will help make health outcomes more equitable in our country. So what are some negative responses? You could read a public option for healthcare or a Medicaid expansion counter plan that says there should be a government healthcare program if people want it, um, but it should not be the only thing. You can also read quality of healthcare disadvantages that will say that uh, this program will make quality of care less good. There will be less competition. Look at quality of care or wait times in other countries. But perhaps the strongest argument against this is the idea that Social Security with capital S's is only about insurance programs for old age survivors. Uh, and people with disabilities, whereas expanding Medicare to be for everyone would basically mean that you're no longer falling into those three categories anymore. So it's very likely that this is not topical according to the most limited interpretation of the topic. The next AF area was also almost a novice case area but didn't make the top four, and that is to lower the retirement age. Uh, lowering the re retirement age will likely help in a lot of ways. Uh, number one is if we lower the retirement age, then people will be better equipped to care for their grandchildren, which will allow their children to go to work if they haven't been able to. Um, it will also improve the health and well-being of people who retire in that retiring earlier means that you don't strain your body for as long and you will be able to enjoy the later part of your life more than you otherwise probably would have. Additionally, it is very common for people who are living in um, their retirement to be impoverished. And when we lower the retirement age, we allow people to retire earlier, which means that they can access their social security benefits earlier uh, so that they won't have to work really, really horrible jobs that barely pay them anything because it's all they can do anymore. Additionally, lowering the retirement age will help to fight discrimination because currently uh, most people who can't live long enough to retire are working jobs that are not as strenuous, whereas communities of color and lower income communities are working the types of jobs that means that they won't really be able to retire at the full age because their life expectancy is so much lower. Additionally, there are some negative responses to this. You could talk about implementing a flexible or a phased retirement counter plan where people slowly reduce the number of hours that they work and then they can access part of social security, but not the full thing. You could also increase or do the opposite of this plan. There are lots of articles saying that we should increase the retirement age or uh, reward people for retiring later as a counter plan because that is one way that we'd be able to pay for the program for longer as well as several private sector disadvantages, again, about how if people are retiring from the workforce, then maybe companies won't be able to hire people as much or there will be fewer people available uh, to work and there will be fewer experienced people. Then we have another affirmative area under expanding Social Security, and this is kind of a catch-all for a bunch of reforms that have been put in various bills, usually by Democratic legislators, and that is to increase benefit payment size. And that can happen in a multitude of ways. One, you could take all of the benefit sizes that change depending on how much 
people made when they were working and increased them uniformly. So every benefit package could get a 5% increase, for example. You could also increase the minimum benefit. So if you earned the smallest amount of money needed to qualify for Social Security, uh, the current payment is incredibly small. I believe that it's somewhere around $50 a month, which is nothing. So you could increase the minimum benefit size um, and then adjust everything else accordingly. And you could also adjust for the cost of living more. The amount of money that people get from Social Security is oftentimes way less than it would have been a few decades ago because inflation has increased and cost of living has increased, uh, as well as there's different cost of living amounts depending on where you are in the country. So potential benefits of this plan is, again, poverty reduction, um, people who are retired, people who are on disability, as well as the survivors of people who fall into those two categories but pass away before they can get their full benefits are oftentimes living in poverty, and this is the only income that they have. So this will help decrease that poverty. It will also improve the standard of living where people are not just getting by on the bare minimum, but they'll be able to have enough money to enjoy themselves more. It will also create more financial independence where these people won't have to rely on maybe as many other social programs, but also won't have to rely on family members. And lastly is there's really good arguments here about how increasing benefit size is really important for both gender equality and disability equality. What I mean by that is many older women uh, did not work and instead were caregivers, or they did do work, but the work was not recognized by the private economy as something deserving of a wage, which means that they didn't quote unquote, earn income in the same way. So they get way less social security. And because women in this country tend to live longer than men, they have more years in which they are past the retirement age. And yet they oftentimes have less money, which means that women uh, who are past the retirement age are way more likely to be living in poverty than men are. Additionally, as far as disability uh, equality goes, there are plenty of disabled folks in this country who cannot afford to survive without massive amounts of help from family or from the government because of the minimum size of payments from social security programs. So what can the negative say to this type of AF? Uh, you can read a means-tested benefit counter plan that says, sure, we should increase social security, but only for people who really need it. The richest of the rich should not get an increase. You could also do um, a counter plan that instead encourages or funds or creates private retirement savings accounts for people so that it's more on an individual basis to save for your retirement than a government program, as well as private sector disadvantages. Again, if people are getting the money from Social Security, then they might not need to have a job, uh, which means that they will not have as many employees to choose from. Next, we have the Supplemental Security Income Program, also called SSI. Uh, this AF would be expanding or otherwise reforming the SSI program under the Social Security Administration. And this is a program in which if you are above a certain age uh, or if you have certain disabilities, you can get uh, money depending on how much income you make and where you live and how much you pay in taxes. Now, this program does not give nearly enough to people to supplement their income uh, to help them survive, but for plenty of people, it's most of the income that they have. So by increasing the amount given, it would help reduce poverty. It would also, again, help people with disabilities. When people get more money and they're not just spending only on their basic needs, then they spend it on other parts of the economy, which stimulates it, just like the stimulus checks during the pandemic. There's also an affirmative to be made about U.S. territories, because right now the Supplemental Security Income Program only applies to the 50 states and the District of Columbia, which means that places like Puerto Rico do not currently have access to this program. So what can the negative say? They could read the Earned Income Tax Credit Counter Plan, which is something that you'll definitely want to do research on. Um, they could also, again, read private sector disadvantages that this will discourage people from working if they're getting money regardless of their work. And there is a really good set of definitions that talks about how Social Security is not the same thing as supplemental security income. Next, under this category of expanding Social Security, you could have a plan dedicated to helping Americans with disabilities. That can include things from the previous two apps, but also it could be increasing the benefit size specifically for people with disabilities, expanding the eligibility criteria or simplifying the eligibility criteria for uh, disabilities that might not currently qualify to be part of the program, 
or allowing people that are working with their disability to receive partial benefits rather than essentially the current situation where only people that are quote unquote so disabled that they can't work are often able to get the full benefits. Uh, so why does this matter or how can this help? It will, again, help reduce poverty for people with disabilities. There's also lots of philosophical arguments and moral arguments about there about ableism or discrimination against people with disabilities and how this would be a step in the right direction to reduce that. People with disabilities having more money means that they'll spend that money as part of the economy, which will help stimulate the economy. Uh, and that actually this is a way to help fight against labor shortages because perhaps when people have their basic needs met, uh, they'll be more likely to be able to go to work if they have the money to help manage or cope with uh, their disability. So what can the negative say? They could read a means-tested benefits counterplan, again, that only these benefits should go to people who don't need it, who don't already have a whole bunch of money. You could read a vocational rehabilitation counterplan, which is essentially to create programs that try to help people with disabilities get back to or get to work. And you could read disadvantages about how this will lead to fraud or misuse. If you've ever seen the show Shameless, uh, Frank Gallagher frequently tries to get on disability so that he doesn't have to work and he fakes it. But the problem is that you have to be very careful reading arguments like these because the problem of misuse or fraud of social security is way more of a scary myth than a reality and has often been used in ways that are discriminatory, specifically on race and ability lines. So you have to be really careful if you're going to read an argument like that. Next, we have a similar app for another category of people that meet the OASD part or definition of social security, and that is increasing benefits for survivors or people uh, who are related to someone directly or married to someone directly who earned money through social security but passed away. So ways that you could increase survivor benefits is you could increase the size or the amount of money eligible to go to the survivors of that person. You could also expand who counts as eligible. So for example, non-biological children don't really count right now, uh, as well as non-married partners. So particularly for same-sex couples who choose not to get married more frequently than their partner can't get the social security benefits that they earned uh, after one person dies. You could also lower the age criteria, uh, which means that you'd be able to start accessing uh, your partner's benefits at an earlier age if they pass away, uh, as well as helping students. Right now, students lose access to their survivor's benefits after they graduate high school or they turn 18, but this could be changed so that they can continue accessing those benefits until after they graduate from college. And additionally, right now, if you are married to someone for the entire time that they're working and then right before retirement, you get divorced, you're not entitled, but they told you, you don't have to work, don't worry about it, uh, I'll take care of you. If you get divorced right before retirement, then you no longer are entitled or, or can you be a survivor if your ex-spouse passes away uh, and takes all of their social security money with them to the grave, essentially. So how would increasing benefits or helping uh, expand the survivor benefits as part of Social Security help? It would help reduce poverty for survivors who have just lost someone very special to them uh, and oftentimes are already struggling economically. It will improve access to education, specifically through helping students afford it because they'll continue to access their survivor's benefits after high school. It can make the family situation more stable because while they're trying to process grief, they're not as worried about the economic situation, uh, and it leads to less uncertainty. And it's also good for incorporating uh, and recognizing the existence of non-nuclear families or non-typical families uh, that are also worthy of economic stability that comes from survivor's benefit. Negative responses that you could make to this include reading a means-tested benefits counterplan again, where you say we should do the affirmative, but we should only do it for people who really, really need it. Uh, you could also do a survivor's tax credit counterplan that basically instead says that you get a certain amount of money back on your taxes if you're a survivor. Um, of someone who qualified for social security. And again, you could read fraud or misuse disadvantages, but you really need to be sensitive if you're gonna read those types of arguments. So the third and final major category of the topic of transfers that we'll discuss is basic income, which is defined as providing a set amount of guaranteed money to every member of a group. Now, if you've heard of basic income before, chances are you feel like a word is missing, and the word starts with the letter U. 
And that's because most of the time people associate the basic income with a universal basic income, which also happens to be a novice case area. Universal basic income has also been, I believe, a public forum debate topic and a Lincoln Douglas debate topic, although it might have been before most of you were in high school. Uh, and a federal jobs guarantee was a topic in November of about three years ago. So seniors may have seen this topic in Lincoln Douglas before as well. But anyways, a universal basic income has been floated by many politicians, one of whom is Andrew Yang, who talks about the freedom dividend. If you've ever heard a proposal to basically give every American over the age of 18 $1,000 a month till the day that they die, that's the universal basic income program. So why would we do a universal basic income? It will definitely help reduce poverty because getting $12,000 a year for millions of people would be enough to put them above the poverty line. A lot of people also argue that Putting in place programs like universal basic income is essential as automation continues to increase from artificial intelligence and technology. Our population grows, but the number of jobs available to people will decrease, which means that we have to be able to find a way to help people survive, even if there aren't jobs for them to do. When people have money, especially lower income folks, they tend to spend that money because the amount of money given to them matters more than the amount of money given to a rich person, even if they're the same. For example, if you make $10,000 a year, $1,000 is a 10% increase, whereas if you make a billion dollars a year, a thousand dollars a month is nothing for you, right? So the idea being that people who are lower and middle class are more likely to spend this money on stimulating the economy, going to different businesses, uh, which is good for other people. And as well as caregiving and creativity, where lots of people who have more creative jobs, whether they be authors, singers, artists, uh, who the starving artist trope oftentimes prevents people from becoming a creative because they're worried about having enough money to keep the lights on. Uh, whereas a universal basic income could empower those people to embrace their passions and chase their dreams, knowing that they'll have a fail safe as well as caregivers. Many people like we talked about before who don't go to work, but are at home caring for children or older family members. This would also give them some semblance of economic security. So how can the negative respond? Well, it was an entire topic. Believe me, there are plenty of negative responses, including but not limited to a means-tested counter plan, which basically says only give the money to some people uh, or the people who need it. Why should we be giving billionaires $1,000 a month is a common argument. You also have tax credit counter plans that basically say people should get money back on their taxes depending on how much money they make instead of just automatically be being given stuff. You have private sector disadvantages about how uh, this may hurt the private sector because instead of wanting to go to work, people will instead just stay home or do other projects because they don't feel like they need their jobs anymore. And this also might not be topical because of a definition of fiscal redistribution that says that you have to tax the rich and transfer to the poor, but this money would tax the rich and then transfer that money to everyone, including the rich. <coughs> So maybe it's not as progressive as one might think. The affirmative response to this argument being what I told you earlier, that even if it's the same amount of money, uh, the equal amount of money will mean more to someone who makes less than it does to someone who makes more. So it's still progressive. The next F area is our final novice case area approved by the NSDA, and that is a basic income program for people at or near the poverty level. This could look like a means-tested basic income program, kind of like the counter plan that we discussed on the previous page. It could also be a negative income tax where until you make a certain amount of money, instead of paying taxes, you're actually given money. Uh, you could also just do a targeted basic income program at cities or places or professions that typically have people that are at or near the poverty level. There are lots of different ways to do a limited in basic income program. The benefits, poverty reduction, even more specifically because it only targets people who are at or near the poverty level. Uh, economic inequality, it will reduce because it will give money to people who need it the most and have so much less compared to the richest of the rich. Economic stimulus, again, when you barely have enough money to keep the lights on, new money that you get isn't going to sit in an account. It's going to be used, which will help stimulate the economy. And it will probably be better for education opportunities. More people will try to go to college uh, or be able to go to college with only a part-time job or with no job if they have money and getting an education will help them escape poverty as well. How could you respond to this? You could respond to this with a universal basic income counter plan, uh, which you would argue is not top 
topical because, you know, it's uh, not redistributive or something. Private sector disadvantages, again, that this will discourage people uh, from working. Or there are multiple topicality arguments that say that uh, you can't means test a basic income. You can't only give it or adjust how much you give to people depending on how much money they make or don't make. And instead, there are, are actually topicality arguments that say that basic income programs have to be universal. So pretty much no matter what type of basic income program you read, somebody will have a topicality argument against you on this topic, unfortunately. But if you really like debating topicality, then that's a good thing. And you can also make that argument as an affirmative and say, no matter what AF we read, the NEG will read topicality under this part of the topic. That's unrealistic. And I think a lot of judges will be persuaded by that. Next, we have a very unique affirmative on this topic, and that is a reparations affirmative. I have seen some people classify this as also falling under the social security category, but I see it as more of a basic income point. Uh, and this is the idea that you implement a basic income program for marginalized groups in the United States who have experienced such incredible levels of oppression, discrimination, or subjugation uh, that even though it can never be repaid, at least the financial problems that they oftentimes experience can be offset or the financial opportunities that haven't existed for generations could be offset by paying them certain amounts of money on a monthly or annual basis. Arguments again here, poverty reduction, people who'd be getting the reparations are groups that are more likely to be living in poverty due to systemic factors. Uh, again, wealth and income inequality. A lot of people talk about the wealth and the income gap, mostly the wealth gap that exists between people of color and white folks. Uh, you can also talk about specific groups of people. The two that come most up frequently in the literature for modern discussions of reparations are uh, black folks who are victims of anti-black racism uh, due to factors like Jim Crow laws, slavery, redlining, uh, any all sorts of discrimination that has existed that has held them back economically, as well as indigenous folks, Native Americans, uh, who are still experiencing the never-ending process of settler colonialism, uh, who have had their lands, their homes, their spaces, their families taken away from them as a result of settler colonialism. Arguably, both of these groups are owed reparations and a basic income program could be the way to do that. How can you respond to this? The critical approach is there are plenty of authors uh, in both anti-Blackness studies and settler colonialism studies that talk about how reparations are a form of apologetics that just mask what really needs to happen. Uh, there's also counterplans that say that instead of doing it on a monthly basis, that you should pay this in a lump sum because otherwise it's possible that people because their life expectancy is lower because of these exact racial factors that we've been talking about, if you split up the amount of money that they're owed across their lifetime, they won't get to access it. Whereas if you give it to them in one lump sum, then they can decide what they do with it. It also means that people who live longer aren't entitled to more reparations than people who live shorter lives. But there are also disadvantages uh, about backlash. The truth is that if we implemented a reparations program in this country, the likelihood that people who did not qualify for it would be very upset and potentially lead to a whole bunch of problems is high. Uh, and you could again read the topicality argument that it's not a basic income because it's not universal. Second to last affirmative area that we'll discuss is a basic income program for refugees. Now, refugees being people who have to flee the place where they came from due to political strife, discrimination, military conflicts, yada, yada, um, oftentimes experience immense levels of poverty. And when they get to a new place, they don't speak the language. They don't have jobs set up for them. They don't have housing guarantees. They oftentimes face discrimination. So a basic income program for refugees, I've also seen federal jobs guarantee program for refugees floating around, uh, would give money to refugees that they just definitely get to have with no exceptions. Uh, that would help reduce poverty amongst refugees, make them less likely to be exploited or take jobs uh, where they are treated badly because they it's all they can find. Uh, it will also help local economies. And frequently, one of the arguments against accepting refugees is that they create a strain on local economies, whereas a basic income program would allow refugees to participate in the local economy, which would stimulate areas. It also might help with integration, uh, getting them out into the community or giving them uh, something to get their bare minimum needs met so that they can afford to go out and get training or language classes to try and integrate further into the society. 
There are different negative responses to this as well. You could read a counter plan that says, let's just increase humanitarian aid to refugee causes so that we can stop the problem at its source rather than funding refugees that are already here. Uh, you could read disadvantages about how, again, this will be bad for the private sector. Refugees may be less likely to start their own businesses or work at different businesses if they are getting a basic income program. Again, backlash, backlash disadvantages, political groups that are not a fan of refugees will likely respond very negatively towards this, perhaps even through violence, which you could argue is a risk that we shouldn't be willing to take. And again, you could say that this is not topical because it's not universal. Um, that is not supposed to be there. So final basic income program that we'll discuss is a basic income for children program. This is the idea that either kids should have money deposited into an account as part of a basic income program that they can't access until they turn 18 or are otherwise emancipated, or it would basically be a basic income program used for parents or caregivers of children uh, so that they would get a certain amount of money for each child that they have. So this is essentially a different version of the child tax credit that recently expired. And the reason why this might be absolutely necessary is that child poverty is abysmally high in the United States, and it's only going to get higher now that the child tax credit no longer is available for people. Uh, there's also an argument that we are facing a situation similar to what's happening in Japan and in Europe, where the aging population is growing a lot faster than the young population because the economy is such that it's not an economic world where people want to have children or can afford to have children if they want them. Whereas if they know that they will have assistance in the form of a basic income program for their children, people are less likely to avoid having kids due to economic fears. It also will mean that the child is better taken care of. They're less likely to be food insecure or housing insecure. Maybe they'll be able to go to better childcare programs or the parents will be able to save for their college all of which will contribute to child development and make the child a happier, more well-adjusted person. How could the negative respond? Well, they could say, let's just expand or bring back the child tax credit as a counter plan. They could also, again, give subsidies to help parents pay for child care. There are arguments that this would hurt the private sector. Maybe fewer moms or fewer dads would go to work uh, if they felt like they would have money to raise their children without working. And again, you could argue that this is not a basic income because it's not universal. So you might be thinking now that we've gone over really 18 Fs and then two sections with like 20 different ways to tax the rich, all of which could happen in any combination, that this is a lot of affirmatives. And it definitely is a lot. And people are going to come up with ones that I didn't list here for sure. But there are five things to ease your worries. Number one, not every single one of them is topical. And as you can see, there are some pretty decent T interpretations that limit this topic to being one of the smallest we've had in a long time. Two, uh, not every single one of these is going to beat perhaps the even more limiting part of the topic, which is how good the counter plans are. So the state's counter plan, the deficit spending counter plan, or the wasteful spending counter plan. Uh, third, all of them have pretty decent on-case responses in the literature. People write plenty of articles about why Social Security expansion, basic income, and federal jobs guarantee are not good programs and won't work. Um, all of them link to at least one or two generic disadvantages that aren't politics. We're going to talk about a lot of those disadvantages. And every single one of them links to the capitalism critique uh, as a fail-safe option. So it might feel overwhelming, but to tell you the truth, I think that this topic is more likely to fare better for the negative than to fare for the affirmative, uh, at least as the season comes to a close. So now we're going to talk about the core neg ground on this topic, and that comes from three different types of off-case positions, counterplans, disadvantages, and critiques. So counterplans, uh, there are more than three counterplans, but I've basically put them into three different groups or categories. The state's counterplan, funding counterplans, and advantage counterplans. Then we'll talk about three different categories of disadvantages, of which I have three examples for each. Those are governance disads, finance disads, and private sector disads. Lastly, of critiques, critiques are obviously the biggest and they change from topic to topic, but not all that much. So there are plenty of critiques that I haven't listed here, but there are critiques that are particularly relevant for this topic of capitalism, feminism, ableism, anti-blackness, and settler colonialism. <clears throat> 
So first, let's talk about the best off-case arguments on this topic for the negative, and those are counterplans, which are the alternatives to fiscal redistribution via one of the three topical transfer areas. First of all, it's a domestic topic, so you know that we had to bring it back, the 50 states counterplan. This counterplan would basically say that the 50 state governments and any relevant U.S. territory should do whatever the plan does. How does it solve? It's basically the plan, but it's technically not. Um, and why is this better than the affirmative? Well, it avoids the federalism disadvantage. It avoids maybe politics or federal elections disadvantages, and it doesn't result in federal agencies being overstretched or trading off on other priorities. How can the affirmative defeat this? Like every other time that there's a 50 states counterplan, I personally buy 50 state theory because it's ridiculous. There's no example ever of 50 states taking uniform action or even 50 states taking non-uniform action, but at the exact same time on the same priority. And I think that arguments about how it's pretty unbeatable but has terrible literature is good. Um, so you could read 50 state feel bad, but you could also read solvency uh, advocate theory against this and say that unless you have an author that says all 50 states should independently but cohesively do the plan, uh, you lose. But if you don't want to go for theory or if you want more than that, you also have arguments about why uniformity and coordination is good, um, about why every state doing it the same or having similar programs or making sure that they're in lockstep is good. And there's also an interesting argument about interstate migration, where if every state does their program differently and somebody wants to move from one state to another state, then they will have difficulties adapting or maybe they won't move or they will try to move to go to a place that has a better program, whereas if they're uniform across the 50 states because they're federally funded, then you don't have to worry about that. And lastly, you could talk about funding disparities and problems. Richer states will have more money to pay for their programs than poorer states will, which means that the quality of services will likely be better in places that are richer. Um, so for example, if, the, if you're like funding your plan through a tax on wealth and the 50 states counter plan says we're going to tax the wealth of each individual in each state, then what about states where there aren't as many wealthy people living there? they won't be able to provide for the program at all or as good as other states do. So I think there's decent answers to the 50 states counter plan, but every affirmative should be ready to answer it. The next counter plan, which I think is more powerful uh, than the previous one actually, is the uh, spending counter plan, the deficit spending counter plan. Uh, and that is that the United States federal government should fund whatever the plan is uh, through deficit spending instead of through taxation. They will argue that it solves pretty much the entire plan unless you're smart and you have an advantage based off of your tax, which I would suggest every affirmative that chooses to tax or specify taxing does have an advantage uh, about why taxing is good because then this counter plan won't solve it, but I digress. Uh, and then why is this better? You can avoid a taxation disadvantage, maybe a capital flight disadvantage where rich people or businesses will try to leave the United States to avoid being taxed by the plan but not the counter plan, or a business confidence disadvantage that says increased taxes have a worse effect on business confidence than uh, deficit spending does or going into further debt does. So how can the affirmative answer this? Uh, you could say PERM do the counter plan is in you could basically make the argument that even if we tax or even if we don't tax, this is just another topical way of doing the plan. So you, you as the affirmative could read essentially the topicality argument against them uh, that says that fiscal redistribution includes taxes and or transfers. So because the counter plan is still a transfer, even though it's not a tax, it's part of the resolution, and therefore you could just do the counter plan to prove the resolution true. Uh, you could also say perm do the plan through the process of the counter plan and just say that it's, you know, there's there's not enough competition there. Some reasons why the counter plan might be a bad idea is international debt. Whenever we increase the deficit, usually we're borrowing money from other countries, and there are people who say that that's bad. There's also reason to believe that this is more likely to increase inflation uh, than funding it through a tax on the rich would. And all of the deficit spending counter plans are going to basically be arguing from a position known as modern monetary theory, which says that um, instead of seeing the government spending as money comes in, money comes out, and we can only spend money going out about money coming in is not true and limits what governments can do. And that basically governments can spend as much money as they want 
uh, and it, it doesn't really have any negative effects. There's plenty of evidence that supports that, but there's also plenty of evidence that doesn't support it. So you could just say that like the thesis of the counter plan is wrong. Third category of a counter plan that I haven't really seen files on yet, but I would be shocked if people don't read it this year, and that is the cut wasteful government spending counter plan, which is to say that we should cut spending for insert any wasteful program. There are hundreds, if not thousands of articles about how much waste the government has on programs we don't need. So you could cut spending for those programs to pay for the plan. It solves because again, it's basically the plan, but it's not. Uh, it's the plan in a funny hat. And why is this better? Um, it probably, oh, I don't think I changed the net. Hold on. Third counter plan that I haven't really seen. <coughs> Third counter plan that I haven't really seen on open evidence yet, but I'd be shocked if some camp didn't cut it or if people didn't read it on their own. And that is the cut wasteful spending counter plan. This basically will say, do the plan, but instead of funding it through tax on the rich, cut any wasteful program that you'll find in the hundreds, if not thousands of articles that complain about how much the government spends on waste. Some people put it as high as 247 billion. It solves because it's basically the plan, but not, it's the plan in a different color or the plan in a funny hat, just like the last two counter plans. Why is it better? One, because it avoids the taxation disadvantage. It also likely avoids the politics or elections disadvantage because cutting wasteful spending is politically popular. Uh, and it also avoids the capital flight disadvantage because people won't try and leave to avoid taxes. Uh, how does the affirmative answer this one? Well, you could again say perm do the counter plan. Uh, cutting wasteful spending and transferring is still counting as fiscal redistribution. Uh, or perm do the plan through the process of the counter plan, just like the previous slide. You could also argue that whatever program that they're cutting is not wasteful, but that means you're going to have to have a lot of those arguments ready to go. You could instead read a politics advantage that says that some political group obviously wanted that spending to happen or it wouldn't still be happening. So maybe it does cause some sort of politics disadvantage. Um, there's also a decent argument that all three major programs, if you're doing it large enough, are so huge that cutting wasteful spending is not enough to be able to pay for them. Uh, so who knows? Any of those responses would help you answer this point. Next for counter plans, there are lots of advantage counter plans. An advantage counter plan is a counter plan that tries to reduce the advantage that the affirmative has. So it's more of a defensive argument because what you're saying is that whatever benefit the affirmative says that you can get from voting for them, you're trying to prove actually you can get that same benefit by voting for us. And even if it doesn't solve all of the advantage of the affirmative, it at least solves one of the advantages or it solves enough of the advantages of the affirmative that it is worth to vote for the counter plan to avoid disadvantages or critiques that the plan causes that the advantage counter plan does not. So there are a whole bunch of different types of counter plans that you could read that will probably solve the impacts that the affirmative talks about, but will not be topical and will not link to disadvantages specific to the three different transfer areas of the topic. So that could be an affordable housing, a carbon tax, earned income tax credit, free college, legalized weed, Medicare for all, minimum wage increase, reparations, sovereign wealth fund, or a universal basic income counter plan. All of those are different things that you could read as a way to solve the advantages of the affirmative while avoiding disadvantages that are caused by their plan and not yours. How is the affirmative going to be ready to answer all of these? Uh, number one is solvency deficits. Your 1AC should be built to explain why specifically only your plan can solve the very specific problem that you're talking about, or that without your plan, the problem can't be solved. Maybe yours is a first step or something. You should also have an advantage or two that you are ready to read, but don't have time to put in your 1AC that you'll be able to save as a sneak attack so that when they read a counter plan to solve the affirmative, you can read a new advantage that isn't solved by their counter plan. Uh, or you should be ready to read disadvantages or reasons why each of these counter plans is a bad idea. And then worst comes to worst, you should always try and prove that the net benefit or this thing that maybe your plan does bad that theirs doesn't is so tiny that it basically means nothing. And then you can go for the permutation because logically there's no reason why you can't do all of these things at the exact same time that you do the plan. The negative is going to argue that you shouldn't do all them at the same time as the plan because of the net benefit. So if you can prove that the net benefit basically doesn't matter, uh, that you can say the benefit of doing both outweighs the potential consequence of causing the net benefit. So now that we've talked about counter plans, 
we can talk about disadvantages, which are the major downsides or the huge negative consequences to fiscal redistribution via one of the three transfer areas in the topic. So there are three major categories of disadvantages that we're going to talk about. And obviously there are more disadvantages than this, but these are general disadvantages that will apply to pretty much every AF on the topic, regardless of which three transfer types they are, which is a really good amount of generic disads. First up is federalism or reliable. You say uniqueness that the states are doing fiscal redistribution now, but the plan makes it so that the federal government doesn't instead. And then you insert any not real kind of nonsense, not wonderful impact that people read on the federalism disadvantage every domestic topic here. There are some people who think federalism is really cool. So you'll be able to have an impact card and it will at least be a small enough net benefit that as long as you can win theory on the state's counter plan, you'll probably be able to win the debate off of federalism. The second category of disadvantages are elections disadvantages and politics disadvantages. Now, if you've watched my channel before, you probably know that I'm not a huge fan of these. I think that this topic is probably the most realistic for politics disadvantages and elections disadvantages that we've ever had. Uh, nobody cares about NATO and not a lot of people cared about water policy. So this is a huge, huge, huge issue that would likely affect elections and would likely affect the inner workings of Congress and the executive branch in the Supreme Court. So an elections or politics disadvantage says that this thing will or won't happen or will or won't win right now, but the plan will cause another group to get upset or a group to lose power or a group to increase their power, which means that where X was going to win or lose or X was going to pass or not pass before, now that's going to change. And the original thing that was going to happen needs to happen in order for this other impact not to be caused. Uh, and the reason why I'm not giving you any specific examples is that this is coming out at the end of July. And this topic will be debated until June of next year. So the politics scenarios, any camp politics scenario is not useful, likely, as soon as camps are over. You need to be cutting your own politics disadvantages with actual uniqueness arguments. But I'll end my get off your lawn speech. Anyways, so the third category of disadvantages underneath this is agency trade-off disads. So this could be the Department of Labor for the Federal Jobs Guarantee, the Internal Revenue Service for a basic income, or Social Security Administration Office for Social Security expansion. Regardless of what the plan is, whichever one, you should have a different disadvantage for each of these departments so that whatever AF they read, you're ready. But you say that the agency that their plan would have to go through is struggling right now, but it's managing right? And there's surprisingly decent evidence for all three of these. However, the plan is going to overstretch or divert the agency away from whatever they're currently working on or make it so that they can't do all of their essential goals. That means that they won't be able to unlock this new priority that they're working on, or they won't be able to do a job that they're currently doing. And then you say that that thing that they need to be able to do or are currently doing is so important that without it, it's going to cause this big issue. The second category of disadvantages is a finance category. Now, you could also call this economy disadvantages, but hopefully you're realizing that the economy is this huge nebulous term that encompasses so many different things. So if you are like, next up is the economy disadvantage, that could mean a hundred different things. So I hate that and I'm being more specific. So here are finance economy disadvantages. The first of which, taxation. You're going to say that taxes are low now, which the evidence for that is great. Uh, the plan is going to increase taxes on the rich and wealthy, and then you say that that's bad, maybe because they invest less, which hurts the economy, uh, and then leads to nuclear war if that's your style. Then second, you have inflation disadvantages. You can say that the Federal Reserve is trying to rein in inflation right now, but the plan will increase inflation because people will have more money and therefore more demand for services. It will maybe force businesses to increase you know, their wages, so they have to increase their prices. Maybe if people leave the country uh, or if, country, if companies leave, we have to import more goods, which is more expensive. Anyways, you're basically going to say inflation goes up. The value of each dollar is going to go down. That's going to push people into poverty and hurt the economy. Uh, with some specific impact substituted for Hertz economy. Then lastly under this, we have interest rate disadvantages. You can talk about how the Federal Reserve uh, is 
decreasing or halting interest rate hikes right now, but the plan is going to increase the amount of money that consumers have to spend where the Federal Reserve will respond by further increasing interest rates because the point of increasing interest rates is to try and slow the economy and that that will lead to interest rate hikes, uh, which is bad for small businesses because they can't take out loans, bad for housing because people can't get mortgages or they don't want to get mortgages because of how high the interest rates are. Uh, and it's bad for the economy, quote unquote, insert specific impact. Third category of disadvantages is the private sector part of the economy. So these are also economy disadvantages, but they're more specific to private sector's involvement in the economy than the federal government's role in the economy. The first of which is business confidence. This is becoming more of a staple in domestic topics, I'm noticing. Uh, business confidence is the idea that business leaders and owners are optimistic about the outlook of the economy. Uh, and so you could say that business leaders are optimistic right now. The evidence for that is meh, uh, but there's certainly people who say that it's increasing. Then you can say that the plan hurts confidence because it will decrease certainty or increase uncertainty, spelled correctly. Um, maybe they'll, it'll result in more regulations or more taxes being placed on the business. Fewer people will be working, which means that it'll be harder for them to find labor or they'll have to pay more for labor. All of those different things, depending on which type of transfer the affirmative does, could hurt business confidence. Uh, falling business confidence means that businesses take less risks. There's less innovation. They don't grow as much. The economy doesn't grow. Insert economic impact there. Whether it's poverty, whether it's housing, whether it's food insecurity, there are a whole bunch of different impacts that you can put for hurting the economy. Um, second is labor shortage disadvantages. I think that this one is particularly good on all three areas. You basically say that during the pandemic, everyone was trying to hire, but also everyone lost their job or everyone during the pandemic lost their jobs. And then after that businesses, every business imaginable seems to have a weird hiring and please forgive us if we're slow, we're understaffed, sign outside now. So employers are starting to recover from that, but the plan is going to in or is going to decrease the number of people who are looking for a job in the private sector because they don't need the money anymore because of universal basic income, because they want to go work for the federal government instead for the federal jobs guarantee, because they can retire earlier or they have enough income from social security to be okay. So either way, that means that businesses will not be able to hire enough people. There will be labor shortages and that is going to hurt the economy. Businesses will collapse, insert impact here. Third and finally on this category, we have the capital flight disadvantage that we've talked about, which is the idea that right now corporations are staying in or are returning to the United States, um, which is good because they bring with them jobs and they bring with them tax revenue. But the plan is going to incentivize companies to try and avoid taxes and regulations by going overseas, which takes their jobs and their taxes with them. And that's bad and hurts the value of the U.S. currency and the U.S. dollar and insert economic impact here. Obviously, there are more disadvantages, but those are the main ones that will apply no matter what you're doing. Uh, yes, each program technically has its own disadvantage, but really when you look at the core objections that everyone has to a basic income, social security expansion, and federal jobs guarantee, they all say that it costs too much money. They all say that it causes inflation. They all say that it's going to hurt businesses. It's basically the same thing. So instead of having disadvantages that are specific to all three areas of the topic, really you're going to have the same disadvantages, but you're going to change the link to be specific to their area of the topic. So next up uh, we have, and finally we have critiques. And critiques, of course, there's a hundred different ways to explain them. My understanding or that I'll give you is moral, rhetorical, and or philosophical objections to fiscal redistribution uh, or something that the affirmative does via the three transfer areas. So what are the different categories of critiques that are especially prominent on this topic? The biggest one by far is the capitalism critique, which says that private ownership over the means of production or capitalism, which is that system, is really bad. And fiscal redistribution is just capitalism, but friendlier and has a smiley face on it. And really the plan is just trying to save capitalism from itself and give it a life vest so that people don't realize how terrible their lives are economically and throw a revolution. And the impact is that by sustaining capitalism, making sure that it continues to exist, um, they make poverty, climate change, exploitation of people, a whole bunch of other stuff inevitable. There's tons of different alternatives to the capitalism critique, but it's not capitalism. That could look like socialism, a communist revolution, degrowth, tons of stuff. There's a litany of options. Uh, how does the affirmative answer this? Per, there are three main ways to defeat the critique. 
uh, three overarching strategies. I'd recommend trying to have parts of all three or elements of all three in every 2AC. And then as the debate goes on, collapse down into one of these. So the first strategy is the perm do both and we're not that capitalist. So you try and prove that you don't really link and that you could get rid of capitalism and still do the plan or that your plan is the first step to getting rid of capitalism. The second point you could do is be like, yeah, you're totally right. We are capitalists and that's awesome. We love capitalism. And you go for the impact turn and you prove that the capitalism critique is just fundamentally wrong. Or third of all, you could go for the alternative fails uh, and that the affirmative plan is a better idea or that the affirmative impacts outweigh and that even if they're correct that capitalism is bad, uh, capitalism is inevitable uh, even under the alternative because the alternative is not going to fix it, but at least the affirmative plan can fix their harms uh, and the alternative can't. So then we have the critique of feminism or feminist critiques. There's Again, this is an overarching area of critiques. There's not one feminism critique, and you should not answer every single critique of feminist scholarship on this topic the same way. But generally, a feminism critique could look like arguing that current economics or economic thought and scholarship and literature is rooted in patriarchal masculinity, and fiscal redistribution is still treating the social care uh, or the social work and the care work that is typically performed by feminine individuals or people who have been assigned female at birth um, as not economically valuable. And instead, they focus more on the propping up of work that happens outside of the home uh, in you know, the privatized society part of the economy. The impact being that patriarchal economics makes gender depression, subjugation, and exploitation inevitable. Um, any other form of impact here as well that typically results from feminist scholarship would work. And there are tons of different alternatives. Ones that I've seen so far are ethics of care, feminist socialism, other things like that. And again, three categories of how you're going to be able to defeat the critique. We're not patriarchal, perm do both, the plan and whatever the alternative is, uh, and our, our rhetoric, our scholarship is compatible with the alternative. Second, uh, you're right, we do focus on the private economy and that's a good thing. You're not saying that sexism is a good thing, but rather your approach to economics is a good thing. And because the alternative does not take your approach to economics, that makes it bad. And then third strategy would be to say that whatever the alternative is fails to resolve both its impacts and the impacts of the affirmative. So the affirmative plan outweighs. The third one also requires that you win on framework. Third of all is uh, ableism critiques or critiques from ableist uh, or disability justice literature. So the thesis of these critiques would be something like current economic thought and policy is based off of the oppression and subjugation of disabled people. Fiscal redistribution oftentimes does not really account or take disabled people into its formulation or into its you know, the creation of those policies, it doesn't really think about them. They're a secondary thought and it marginalizes people that do not work in the way that is seen as work by current economy. The impact being the subjugation, exclusion, oppression, insert other negative word of disabled people. There are lots of different alternatives to ableism critiques like disability justice, refusal of ableist rhetoric, body neutrality, all sorts of stuff. And again, three main answers. We're not ableist, perm do both. Uh, we're not this bad thing that your alternative does. You're right. And that's good. The alternative causes a bunch of bad stuff to happen or the alternative doesn't solve your impacts or our impacts, but at least our plan solves some impacts. And that means that we outweigh plus we're winning on framework. Fourth critical area being anti-blackness critiques. You argue that the U S economy is rooted in the oppression, death and labor of black people. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of anti-blackness critiques. So this is way too general. This is also not my area of expertise. So if anyone in the comments wants to do a much better job at explaining it than I am, I'd greatly appreciate it. But fiscal redistribution links will usually look like failing to recognize uh, anti-blackness as the center of our economy. So if your economics understanding does not factor in or base itself upon anti-blackness, it's going to reify that anti-blackness by ignoring the prolonged impacts that slavery, discriminatory laws, and more have. The impact is usually something along the lines of social death, exploitation, actual death, oppression of Black people. The alternative can come from a whole bunch of different areas of Black scholarship, like Afrofuturism, Afro-pessimism, Black Marxism, things like that. Uh, how does the affirmative answer? Perm do both slash we're not anti-Black. The plan is compatible with the alternative, and so is our rhetoric and our you know scholarship. 
Second of all, we are not this thing that your alternative does. That's true, but that's actually a good thing. The alternative does something really bad that we don't, and that means you should prefer us. And lastly, the alternative fails to solve for its impacts as well as the plan's impacts, and the plan outweighs, uh, and we're winning on framework. Fifth and finally would be critiques of settler colonialism. Um, this was pretty common on the water topic, and I think that it's going to be common on this one as well. You argue that the United States is founded upon, just like with the anti-Blackness critique, uh, that everything in our society, particularly the economy, is built upon a foundation of violent settler colonialism at the expense of indigenous people or Native Americans. Um, and you argue that fiscal redistribution does not recognize the importance of land or the fact that all of the economic activity that's happening is happening in a place and off of the backs of and on the land of displaced peoples. So when you redistribute equally across areas, you're basically taking something from, it didn't belong to the rich people you're taking it from, but you're redistributing it to people that it doesn't belong to either. Uh, and you're focusing on not the most important thing, which is land. The impact being the displacement and elimination culturally, physically, ontologically of indigenous folks. And then as far as alternatives go, there's a whole bunch of different alternatives for the set coal critique, including land back, decolonization, settler uncomfortability, refusal, radical imaginaries, indigenous economics, all sorts of stuff. Again, three categories of answers. We're not settler futurists, which is usually what the plan will be accused of being, slash perm do both. We're compatible in our words, in our scholarship, and in our plan with whatever it is that your alternative does. Uh, you're right, we're not this thing your alternative does as our second option, and that's a good thing. You impact turn the alternative, uh, or you read disads to the alternative. You're not saying that settler colonialism is good. That's certainly something you could use your freedom of speech to say, but I sure hope you don't. And then third of all, the alternative fails. Whatever they're doing it does not address the critique's impacts, but it also does not address the affirmative's impacts. So the plan does at least solve their own impacts, and their affirmative is winning on framework. So... We've gone through a whole bunch of stuff, and hopefully this gives you everything that you're going to need to get ready for the topic and maybe come back and watch it again throughout the season to see how correct I was at my predictions or see if things have really changed in the meta of the topic. I've attached some resources uh, here on this presentation as well as in the description of the video. So the NFHS has a collection of resources, um, and that instead of saying emerging technologies should be different, but I think that the old link is still being used. So the NFHS has resources, use that. Then the topic paper, if you'd like to read the people who proposed the topic in the first place, uh, you can read it there. Um, we, I have created a topicality file that basically has all of the important interpretations that I talked about in this video. Uh, some of those are cards that I cut myself and didn't see in any of the camp files for topicality so far. Some of those I just took the best cards from other places. So if you're looking for a place to start on topicality, there you go. Um, you can also watch the YouTube video where they hammered out the final wording of the topic. Uh, and the audio quality isn't the best, but you can also read the transcript if you click on the YouTube video. And there's a website called Debate US that usually has a lot of policy resources. Just unfortunately, a lot of them are paywalled. So additionally, I think my lecture is awesome, but I did not really give you any background or any context for understanding how we arrived at the resolution, understanding what's going on in the status quo, what fiscal redistribution has looked like in the past. So if you would like to watch lectures that also cover those things, you should watch any or all of the lectures that I've put here. You can read through some slides. Um, all of these camps have done a fantastic job, uh, and my topic lectures to complement theirs, not to replace theirs or to disagree with theirs. So final thoughts. This has been a long lecture. Thank you for sticking around for all of it. Um, affirmatives. You should be creative, but you're not going to get to be creative in the way that you usually like to. You're not going to be able to read a tiny app with fake evidence or evidence that comes from like two articles that no one else could access except for you. Uh, and then the expect to beat the negative because they're going to be reading a whole bunch of generics and you're just going to be ahead of them on the truth of everything. Instead of that, if you, you should be creative on how you're going to implement your plan, which has fallen out of style. How are you going to fund it? How much are you going to provide? What is the exact parameters of your version of the program? And be ready to defend that rather than trying to call some random welfare policy, social security. Second, negatives. 
yes, you have better generics on this topic than you have had in a long time. That means that you have zero excuse for spending the majority of your time doing case-specific research. You don't have to do as much just to have off-case positions that are going to apply to a whole bunch of random affirmatives. You have your generics, which means that you should not be reading generics if you're debating an AF for the second time, because you don't have to worry about being overburdened by the sheer number of affirmative cases. Lastly, please don't run away from clash. The fact that this is a smaller topic gives you a unique opportunity to have more direct debates on both the off-case positions being read and on the on-case positions being read. So rather than trying to completely out quantity, I'd say that you should also try to out quality them, have not just a card on your specific argument or on your generic argument, have the best card on your argument and interact with their evidence. So with that being said, thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you in future videos and I'm really looking forward to the upcoming policy debate season.